okay. Yeah, I um, I'm not quite sure how to engage people, but I, I wanted. I, I can announce you first, all right? Okay, how, let's do the mic. Okay. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. The open forum. The open forum is starting right now. It's starting, it's starting right, right now. now. Today's theme. Today's, today's theme. Why inequality destabilizes economy. Destabilizes economy. And what we can do about it. And what we can do about it. Please come. Please come. Okay. Hi. Have you heard about Bloomberg Bill? Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Okay. Okay. Do you guys know about Bloombergville? Do you guys, guys know, know about, about Bloombergville? I do. I do. I do. Do you? Do you? Okay. In June. In June. In New York. In New York. A bunch of people bunch slept on the streets. A bunch of people slept on the streets. For almost three weeks. For almost three weeks. To protest budget cuts. To protest budget cuts. In the New York City budget. In the New York City budget. And they were mindful of the state budget cuts. And they were mindful of the state budget cuts. And the federal budget cuts. And the federal budget cuts. And all the austerity and happening more and more in New York and elsewhere. Maybe we can hear you. Maybe we, we can just do it regularly okay. if you can speak out. Okay. So can you hear me back there? Okay. So what I wanted to talk about is why inequality destabilizes the economy. Okay. So the short answer is that globally we have a non-system. We have a system that is incoherent, that doesn't function well together. The longer answer is that the Bretton Woods system, does anybody not know what I mean when I say the Bretton Woods system? Okay, we're talking about the UN, the IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank, and to a certain degree, the World Trade Organization, the WTO. These are institutions that were created after World War II, supposedly to keep a stable global economy, to make growth happen after the Second World War, but it was set up under certain rules. Okay, so what are the interests that the Bretton Woods system served? It's the same that are being discussed here. It's the interests of the top earners versus the interests of the bottom earners, okay? There's a story told by an economist named Raymond Mikesell, who was in charge of creating the formula. Can you still hear me okay? For creating the formula for the voting rights, the weights that determine who gets to vote, who gets to veto at the IMF, and how much money they can borrow, and how much they get to contribute. He was told, make it look economic, but give us a formula that's a political division of the world that reflects the end of World War II. The US gets the biggest chunk. Britain, the UK, gets half of that. Give Russia a little less than the UK, and give China a little less than Russia. This is basically the political formula that became this very, very complicated system of weights and voting measures that determines how things get decided at the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and all of the policies that they influence. Okay. Any questions so far? So, what is the IMF supposed to do? Supposedly, it's supposed to keep a stable global economy, okay? It's supposed to coordinate the monetary system, the exchange rates between all the different countries in the world. It's supposed to promote certain things as well. What has it promoted? It's promoted free trade, 
You know, it's promoted very lax financial regulation, right? And it's promoted policies that have consistently favored rich countries over poor countries. So, what effects do these IMF policies have? I, I passed around, or I think some of you have some sheets. I want to share some research with you. It's got a few graphs. It's not a big deal. It's really easy to understand. But if you look at the one that's got a one in the top right corner, okay, this talks about something called household debt to GDP, or gross domestic product. It's basically how indebted are households compared to the overall product of society. Right? And what we've learned is for about the last 30 years, for workers, you know, for your bottom 99% or for the <coughs> bottom 95% that this graph actually represents, um, what we see is rising indebtedness and inequality at the same time in the lead up. You can see that workers' household debts go up, but the debts of the rich stay pretty much flat. They just jump around, okay? If you go turn it over and look at the page number two, these are policies that have also affected something called debt to income ratios. What are debt to income ratios? In this US data, okay, the indebtedness, how indebted are the upper 5%? Well, that stayed pretty much flat since the 80s. It's gone up a little, it's gone down a little, but over time, it hasn't changed. The upper 5% haven't gotten more in debt. But if you look at the remainder, it's gone way up, and it's gone up especially since the dot-com bubble and the housing bubble, okay? So, if you go to the third page, the one with a three in the corner, this shows you that another effect these policies had is that the financial sector grew like crazy, okay? It got massively bigger, both in terms of the number of firms, in terms of the volume of transactions, in terms of the speed of the transactions, in every way imaginable, okay? And what this tells you, this graph, is that the amount of private credit to gross domestic product, credit to GDP, as well as the bank's share of
consume more and they invest more and what they invest and consume gives them more and this goes back to workers who have to pay it back with interest. Now look at the bottom
I think the movement is discussing. What are the rights of, for instance, students with student loans? What are the rights for students with student loans? It's getting discussed in the major media. It's getting discussed in the major media. It's where it has to start. You asked about how do you have a quick sound bite. Um, you know, why is it that Walmart, why is it that Walmart and the case by the women of Wal who work for Walmart. Wa In the case for women who work for Walmart. Why did the Supreme Court refuse to hear this? Why did the Supreme Court refuse to hear this? This class action lawsuit. Because class action lawsuit. There's an attack in the United States. There's an attack in the United States. On the very idea of collective rights. On the very idea of collective rights. We're all supposed to be individuals. We're all supposed to be individuals. Looking after ourselves. Looking after ourselves. You know? But we bailed out the banks. But we bailed out the banks. And we need a social contract. We are a society. We're not... We need a social contract. We are a society. We are a collectivity. We are a collectivity. Sort of like a statement, but one thing I've gotten so far from what I've learned here is to start supporting the unions that do exist right now. And when you see people protesting, support the unions, look into them, see what you can do, and hopefully someday work in a union and support more unions. How did um Mike check. Mike check. Mike check. Raise your voice a little bit. <laughs> Raise your voice and we will repeat it. All right. um, how did the Clinton administration? How did the Clinton, Clinton administration, administration. Um, kind of like opened up the credit for everyone else? For example, if you see how the Clinton administration um, took the 401k from the 80s and 
place it in the stock market and allow all the banks to take out that portion of their of their um, liability out of the balance sheets and then place it into the markets and also how he expanded credit all across um, from mortgages um, to um, credit cards and all of that. How, how did he influence um, the current state they were in? How did his policies influence? Well, in, in brief, Mike check. Mike check. In brief, the Clinton administration, the Clinton administration supported deregulation, supported deregulation, begun under, you know, Bush and Reagan before him. Which begun under Reagan and Bush. This idea has been going on for a long time. The idea that markets regulate themselves. The idea that markets regulate themselves. Well, they do, but they don't always produce socially acceptable outcomes. But they don't always produce socially acceptable outcomes. And that's the part of the equation we're not supposed to talk about. That's the part of the equation we're not supposed to talk about. Also, the Clinton administration. Also, the Clinton administration. Like the others. Um, embrace an idea of globalization, embrace the idea of globalization that liberalized everything but labor. You know, what would that look like? The right to go wherever the work is, the right to have a social system there, and the right to a fair and livable wage. No. So I don't know. I just failed at the Clinton administration, but right beforehand, the Clinton administration. I feel that he was able to expand credit. You. Let me ask you. History happened in the course of those presidencies. History happened in the course of those presidencies. One of those graphs shows a huge growth in the financial industry. One of those graphs shows a huge growth in the financial industry. Right? From the early 80s to the present. From the early 80s to the present. A lot of things made that possible. A lot of things made that possible. Growth of internet technologies and IT. Growth of internet technologies and IT. How do they do all those super fast trades? How do they do all those super fast trades? The hardware had to be there to make that possible. The hardware had to be there to make that possible. You know, the cables, the fiber optic cabling had to be laid to make all that possible. The cabling, the fiber optic cables had to be laid to make that all possible. And as the industry grew, it was the industry grew. It it grew by orders of magnitude. Because of all of these circumstances. Because of all of these circumstances. And a policy regime. And a policy regime. That favored zo no regulation or very little regulation. It favored no regulation, very little regulation. Bye.
Patrick. I've been reading about the toxic effects of inequality. I've, I've been, been reading, reading about, about the toxic, toxic effects, effects of inequality. inequality. In affluent countries. In affluent countries. According to the Equality Trust in the UK. According to the Equality Trust in the UK. Countries with big income inequality. Countries with big income inequality. Suffer disastrous effects. Suffer disastrous effects. Like high infant mortality. Like, like high infant, infant mortality. mortality. This confuses me. This confuses me. I would have thought. I would, I would have, have thought, thought that having a few billionaires that having a few billionaires wouldn't kill babies. Wouldn't, wouldn't kill, kill babies. babies. I have no idea. I have no idea why the numbers work out this way. Why the numbers work out this way? Do you have insight? Do you have insight? Well, inequality isn't only about income. Inequality isn't only about income. We live in a divided society. We live in a divided society. I'll tell you a little story. I'll tell you a little story. I was at a conference in the winter. I was at a conference in the winter with about 10 big bankers with about 10 big bankers with 10 academics, 10 academics who advised the government on executive compensation the government on executive compensation and the people who do that regulating and the people who do that regulating at lunch i happened to sit at a table at lunch, I happened to sit at a table with someone who had been the chief risk officer, of a notorious institution. He was talking with an academic about why executive compensation should not be regulated. This is what he said. This is what he said. Man, we took a real hit. Man, we took a real hit. We lost millions. That hurt. We lost millions. That hurt. I, I was shocked. I was shocked. They went on having their conversation. They went on having their conversation. This seemed like a perfectly reasonable explanation. It seemed like a perfectly reasonable explanation. So I had to say. Excuse me. Excuse me. But don't you realize that the people who got hurt in this crisis were the people who lost their jobs and their homes and their pensions, etc. And they looked at me like I had dropped down from Mars. Dropped down from Mars. So the reason I tell you this story in answer to the question Does inequality kill babies? Does inequality kill babies? I had an insight. I had an insight. It's not that people like Chief Risk Officer Man doesn't care. It's not like people like Chief Officer Man doesn't care. They don't see us. They don't, see us. they don't see our lives. They don't see our lives. They don't see those dying babies because we're not a good investment for them. They don't see those dying babies because we're not a good investment for them. They see their own class. They see their own class. And they see global investment opportunities with cheaper labor in other countries. It's not a good investment for them. It's not a good investment for them to have a great educational system here. To have a great educational system here. To have a really top-notch healthcare system. To have a really top-notch healthcare system. That's universal. That's universal. People like that see it as a luxury. 
People like that see it as a luxury. And it's not one. And it's not one. They want to invest in. They want to invest in. So, you know, we're not a good investment. We're not a good investment. But if we come out here, but if we come out here and go to their houses, and go to their houses, and sit in their banks, and sit in their banks, and talk to their institutions like I do at work. Maybe they won't be so blind anymore. Maybe they won't be so blind anymore. When we think about our own rights, and when we, when we think, think about, about our own rights, and when we, uh, thinking about what demands we should make, and thinking about, about what demands we should make, how can we think about them? How, how can, can we, we think, think about them without infringing on the rights? Without infringing on the rights and oppressing and oppressing other people and people in other countries. Other people and people in other countries. From whom, um, from whom our country has already been colonizing for centuries. From whom our country has been colonizing for centuries. That's a really good question. That's a really good question. Because inequality cuts two ways. There's growth in inequality globally. There's growth in inequality globally. Between the rich countries and the poor countries. Between the rich countries and the poor countries. But there's also inequality. There's also inequality. Growing inside countries. Growing inside countries. Especially in the United States. Especially in the womb of Asia. And in Europe. So, this, this comes to the question, how, how to finance and to move this occupation forward, consistent with its own principles. So, uh, it has to be talked through. Do you, uh, Sarah, so Sarah, do you have, mic check. Mic check. So Sarah, do you, um, so Sarah. So Sarah. Do you have any ideas of how we would fund it in the way that you're saying that would be consistent with our ideals and principles? Do you have any guidance or ideas in that area? Well, something that gets talked about all the time at these in at these institutions that I work around, is taxing the financial sector. Is taxing the financial sector. A financial transactions tax. A financial transactions tax. Is something some people talk about. Is something some people talk about. As a mechanism. As a mechanism. To slow down the speed of trading. To slow down the speed of trading. And to make them pay and to make them pay for the consequences to society for the consequences to society of the risks that they take. Of the risks that they take. That's one idea. That's one idea. But such a tax as with a as with a millionaire's tax as with a millionaire's tax comes to the government. Comes to the government. So if such a thing were to be advocated for there would also have to be political dialogue and demands for how to use it. You said that trade unions are vital to stabilizing the economy. You said that trade unions are vital to the economy. I used to work at a union. I used to work at a union. Currently, most unions in the United States. Currently, most unions in the United States pour millions of dollars into the Democratic Party. Pour millions of dollars into the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party 
is not a good Labour Party. The Democratic Party is not a good Labour Party. They don't deserve those millions of dollars. They don't deserve those millions of dollars. We deserve those millions of dollars. We deserve those millions of dollars. Social movements like this one. Social movements like this one. Need labor support. Need labor support. And labor needs our support. And labor needs our support. We can build a social and labor movement. We can build a labor and labor movement. Independent of the Democratic Party. Independent of the Democratic Party. Nice. And we need to. And we need to. So let's work with labor to do that. So let's work with labor to do that. I agree. I agree. I agree. You know, it's political deadlock. Political deadlock. For decades. For decades. Hasn't gotten us anywhere. So Mike Jack. Mike Jack. Do you think that do you think that Negative consequences of globalization. The negative negative consequences, consequences of globalization could be offset. Could be offset by a stronger international by workers a, movement. By a stronger international workers movement. Short answer. Short answer. Definitely. Definitely. The question I'm trying to pose today. The question I'm trying to pose today. Is how far we want to go. Is how far we want to go. I believe I the research I presented to you, I the I presented to you makes a really good case. Makes a really good case for how strong labor unions, how strong labor unions could stabilize our economic system. Could stabilize our what we have to ask ourselves is stability enough? Is stability justice? Is stability justice? So maybe we can close Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Mike Jack. Mike Jack. Jack. Uh, I, I am from the Open Forum Subcommittee. I am from the Open Forum Subcommittee.